The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice Tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMDs, Alpha, Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now, advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too. And there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world where you can offer clients access to local and international investments. A world where you can engage with clients meaningfully, backed by powerful data and insights with mobile-friendly technology. A world where you can build business efficiencies through scaled managed accounts and bulk reporting. And a world where you can get all the latest news, research and insights to spot the changes that really matter. Wealth is more than just money. It's about opportunity and progress. A world of opportunity awaits you at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Hello and welcome to the Ensemble Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter Diamantidis and the guest joining me here today to deep dive into Open Invest has in fact been a financial planner in the UK, is also a PwC alumni or survivor, depending on your perspective, and even worked in dealer group land here in Australia. So has a very diverse understanding of all the different parts that make up this industry. Thank you so much for joining me on the show. Ravi Verma. Woo! <laughs> Thank you for the uh, great introduction and having me on, Peter. Really, um, really pleased that we found time to have a chat today. Not at all, not at all. And I'm really interested in digging into what you guys are doing there at Open Invest. It's um, something that I think is going to come up more and more. But before we dive in, I'd love to get to know you a little better through your use of technology. So, what is your most used emoji? Do you even use emojis? Well, look at. Emoji-wise, I tend not to use too many emojis, but what I do love is dishing out that little smiley face with the tears of joy, <laughs> because it basically means someone has brought to me some laughter and fun, um, and that's you know that's what life's all about, right? We, we absolutely we we spend a lot of our time being serious, particularly in our industry. So yeah, I, I love dishing out that emoji. So I'd say that that's probably my most used one. No, I like it. In fact, it's it's an unusual one. I'm not sure that's come up before. So well done for being outside the <laughs> thumbs up, which is the most popular one so far on the podcast. Now, you know, we all live with our smartphones almost surgically attached to us. So imagine you had to delete everything off your smartphone and you could only keep three apps. Which ones would you keep? Yeah, look, that, that sounds like a dream world to me. I I've, This year I've made a concerted effort to actually – have less screen time and more nature time. Mm-hmm. But if I was only to have three apps, first, I'm, I'm music's a big part of my life. So I would say Spotify, Bandcamp, Mixcloud, SoundCloud. I've grouped them as one. Those sort of apps are yep. invaluable to me and my uh, my family because we, we always listen to music. Um, recently, I've got into, over the past few years, modular synthesis. And um, on the long journey to work, to the office uh, on the bus and the train, um, a great way for me to get creative is use that time on an app called Hexen, uh, which allows me to sort of make music, and twiddle twiddle bits and pieces and really get deeper into that understanding of modular synthesis. Ooh. Um, and then finally, my beloved English Premier Football Club, uh, Wolverhampton Wanderers FC, uh, I pretty much check that app daily just to see (laughs) news uh, and, um, you know, particularly if you've lost, to get some positive messaging um, because it is a Wolves, official Wolves app and they're never too um, uh, negative on that even when you lose. So those would be my three. And so are you, like my husband, and get up at the wee small hours to watch it live? 
look, I, I, these days I just cannot get up yeah. early. So I generally get up on a Sunday morning and watch uh, watch the game, the full game with my son uh, on a Sunday morning. So ah, perfect. It, mean, it means that, you know, we can watch it together as opposed to me getting up at 2 a.m. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, my uh, husband has this expression actually that's called silent windmills, which is uh, when he's watching the game at two or three a.m. It's very exciting. He's jumping up and down, but he can't make any noise because I'm asleep, and so he's doing these <laughs> silent windmills with his eyes. Yeah. And our poor dog, you know, looks at him in mystification, like, "What is going on?" <laughs> yeah, that must be a rather bizarre sight at two a.m. in the morning. I think someone jumping up is. and down in silence. I think so. I think so. So, oh, okay. Not a fan of sporting fans. We have a lot of those. So, so fingers crossed for your season. Thank you. Um, I ho- hope it all goes well. <laughs> Let's dive into Open Invest. So, for those that maybe aren't aware of it, I mean, I'm, I'm sure most are, but let's take a step up and just talk about where it sits in the sort of advice tech, fintech space. You know, what category does it fall under? Who do you sort of normally get lined up against? Like, where do you guys fit? Yeah, okay. Good, um, great. Great question. So, look, we're we're a technology and online investing platform. Really, we're we're designed to help advice firms open up and monetize their investment expertise through having their own online investing solution, which basically means it allows advice firms to really attract and serve a new audience into their brand and wealth ecosystem. But it's all delivered via our our, at the Open Invest white label solution. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, that's very high level in terms of what we do. But really, uh, you know, what we're really talking about is, you know, the ninety percent of Australians who are unadvised. Um, yeah, yeah. And how do you make professional investing accessible and affordable to the mass market um, of Australians who, you know, can't afford? Or don't want a personal advice relationship. Yeah. Um, so it's we're sort of unique in this space. Okay. Um, okay. Although I'd imagine, and and in part possibly because of white labelling, so that would be a bit different. Is there might be tools out there that are designed to, you know, engage with investing with uh, you know that sector of the public, but generally they're their own product or own offering, um, not something you can white label for your practice or your business. Is that is that fair? Yeah, that that's fair. And and also, you know, um, there are a number of other white label solutions out there. Mm. Um, but they've come at it from a different end of advice than we have. And what I mean by that is, for example, we're not trying to automate or digitize the advice process right. in any way. Whereas the other um, online investing solutions that offer a white label solution, they've come at it from a personal advice perspective in that they've tried to digitize the advice process, uh, yeah. the personal advice process. So, you know, with them, there'd still be an online uh, fact find. There'd be a risk questionnaire, which is done yeah. online. And then there'd be an automated automated generation uh, of an SOA. So, yeah, okay. Um, whereas we've really come at it from a general advice perspective. Yep. And, you know, the, the other sort of key difference, if we're sort of touching on, and, you know, what else is available in the market is some of those other Y label solutions, they actually require you to buy into and use their investment um, IP via their own model portfolios. Whereas right. through us, we what we're actually able to do through our Y label offering is deploy for advice firms their own online investing solution, but allowing them to offer actually their own model portfolios and investment IP right. delivered in the brand of the firm, the advice firm, with their own content flowing through to end investors. And it's all accessible from the website of the advice firm. And because it is delivered via a general advice um, um, structure, it means it's scalable and profitable. Okay. Okay. Interesting. All right. So how did it come about? What was the, you know, what was the, what did it respond to or what was the evolution that, that brought this to, to bear and particularly, you know, targeting advisors as a channel as opposed to, say, direct to the public? Yeah. So maybe worth me just spending a few moments just talking about our journey. So the co-founders of the business, um, you know, five years ago and, and prob- probably many years before had a, had a vision to, to sort of build from scratch an investment platform um, 
design not not necessarily with the advisor in mind, but actually with the end investor. And, mm-hmm. and when we started life five years ago in terms of a, a sort of solution, we actually launched our own direct to consumer solution, which exists today. It's openinvest.com.au. And really what we were looking to do was build out um, a, a solution which would provide access to professionally managed model portfolios for the mass market of Australians who needed help. And so that's really where we were born. And, and the first iteration of that was really our own direct-to-consumer solution, which we still market and run today. And the vision for that is really to have um, you know, some of the top global asset managers mm. offering model portfolios and for any Australian to come to our website and choose a choose a uh, asset manager they feel an affinity with yep. pick a model portfolio and invest directly um, without necessarily having to go through this personal uh, personal advice process so yep. um, on that side of the solution which is I know we're not really talking about it today but on that side of the solution you know we've got BlackRock JP Morgan and Schroeder's available and we've got some others uh, going live on that so that's really where we were starting our journey but a couple of years ago we recognized that actually in the industry there were so many other firms uh, financial services participants who actually had their own um, audience that they were trying to serve yep. um, they were wanting to sort of put their arms around this new cohort of um, um, prospects clients, investors, um, but do it outside of that sort of traditional personal advice process. So we actually started a couple of years ago, started configuring our technology, our legal structure, our operations to enable any firm actually to to have their own online investing solution. So that's really okay. where we began. So really we're, we're an out-the-box, end-to-end, you know, fully supported investment solution really built to help the mass market of Australians who are seeking help with investing. We want to bring access to professionally managed model portfolios to Australians who who struggle to do themselves and really giving everyone the confidence, reassurance and the well being that comes with having a professional uh, on your side. The the other thing was, you know, we know having built the investment platform from scratch, we know that technology bills are expensive, <laughs> they're time consuming, often they they fail to deliver. Um, so, you know, what we've built is really a highly configurable, quick to implement solution. And that, that was really part of why we decided to start white labeling the solution as well, because we knew we had this amazing piece of technology and, and put the right legal structure around it. And we wanted to, you know, go out and make sure that Every firm had an opportunity to, you know, serve those um, people that they just could not serve under the traditional advice model. Yeah, okay. And so I'm assuming this is investment only, not super, because that would add its own layers of complexity and and difficulty at your end? Yeah, currently it is an uh, investment only uh, offering, but we have got superannuation on the roadmap. We're committed to delivering superannuation. Um, We're looking at, uh, we've got some consultants in at the moment who are you know advising this and looking at our structures and, and like you said that's a that's a heap more headache <laughs> when you go into superannuation but yeah it's, i mean look we've got we've got 40 partner firms signed up uh, as a white label solution and all of them have asked us for super so we, it's definitely something that we want to deliver likely i would i would say next year the yep. end is when we start um, going down that okay. road. Now, you mentioned the, the partner firms. So, you know, in terms of the ones that you've been engaging with and maybe others that have shown interest, what's your take on the sort of practice or advisor, I guess, that this works really well or, you know, for the business and the clients who it works well for, whereas, you know, versus who it might they might struggle with the concept or struggle with the implementation? Yeah, sure. So, look, um, I guess each for each one of those sort of 40 firms that I mentioned, they've each got their own reasons actually for for <laughs> setting up their own online investing solution. And actually, just stepping back from before I go into sort of talking about some of these firms, from my conversations with firms over the last, you know, how many years, so many years I've been in the industry, there's really, what I've encountered is there's really four main uh, pain points that most advice firms 
uh, are faced with. One is, you know, we've got we've got a list of orphan or unprofitable clients in our business, people who we've actually had a relationship with for many years, but those people no longer fit our personal advice model. Now, we don't really want to get rid of these people because we've been looking after them for so many years. So, you know, how do how can we use a digital solution to um, to to find a home for them um, where we're still engaged with them with our brand? That's that's one pain point. There's a pain point I often hear is, you know, advice firms have a lot of prospects coming to them either through referrals or you know personal recommendations, but those prospects don't meet the firm's minimum advice threshold Mm -hmm. when i talk about minimum advice threshold it's really you know these days most firms i speak to say well if the client's got less than five hundred thousand a million in investable money we we can't really deliver a cost-effective advice process to them so how do you deal with those prospects where you actually want to have a relationship with them um but they just don't fit your model so again how do you put your arms around them using a you know online investing solution Third pain point is really the adult children of existing clients. Now, we know, yeah. obviously, $3.5 trillion, um, is being passed through into generational wealth over the next two decades. But we also know that, you know, from data, that 13% of adult children, well, sorry, only 13% of adult children keep their parents' financial advisor. So yeah. how, do, how do you use the digital solution in your business to actually engage with the next generation and, and bring bring these you know kids of existing clients into your brand um, start engaging with them now so when this intergenerational wealth transfer happens you're going to be the natural partner for them yeah um, for advice and then you know just just quickly touching on the fourth sort of common pain point it's really how how do firms work um, better with accounting referral partners often hear stories of yeah. from planners who say, yep, you know, we've got various accounting referring partners, but we don't generally tend to get that much coming through from them in terms of right um, referrals. But that's generally uh, from, I feel that's generally because most of those accounting clients fall into that 90% of Australians who right. don't want to pay for advice. But for an advice firm to actually now go to the accounting referral partner and actually have a secondary offering, Mm. You know, we've got personal advice. This is what it is. This is what it entails, and it's what it costs. But we've also got an online investing solution because all those accounting clients, particularly self-managed super fund trustees, um, maybe they don't want a full personal strategic advice relationship. However, they still need help with investing, so it gives it gives the firm something, um, you know, a secondary offer to go back to. Now, yep. some of those firms who you know it's really working well with, and I'll. I'll throw out a few examples because, like I mentioned, each firm has got its own reasons Mm. for setting up the solution. So, for example, look, we've got firms like uh, Collins House, uh, Knight Financial Group, um, who have prominent local brands because they're on radio. So, they've got a slightly um, different need because they're, they're... they're known in their wider community because of radio. Their advice thresholds rather high, but they've got mm-hmm. all these people coming to them. So they've set up their solution because they needed a uh, a more efficient way of bringing people into their brand. We've got accounting firms, integrated accounting and wealth firms like Kelly and Partners. Uh, we're going live with Pasco Partners. We've actually just signed a deal with a top 15 national accounting firm. Mm-hmm. And they've got a database of accounting clients who want help with investing but don't necessarily want personal advice so yep. that allows the the accounting firm to be on the complete wealth journey with their client um enabling them to engage in multiple channels of their business it, you know perfect for those who don't want or can't afford personal advice so then we've got firms like you know allman partners fmd financial um Arrow, who really set up their online investing solution to cater for the next generation, the adult children right. I just mentioned, and and also deepen those relationships with those the CAD referral partners. We, we've also got some pretty niche sort of firms, firms like um, SWU Group, who deal mainly with the Chinese community. We've just launched with a firm who called Laverne Capital, who deal with mainly the Indian community, and we're launching in the coming 
weeks um, with an Islamic firm. And, mm-hmm. you know, they're all trying to make accessible, better financial outcomes across their communities. So it's got this sort of approach where, you know, rare does it work for firms? It's really um, serves a multi- multitude of opportunities and, and ways that firms can um, reach um, a new audience and have Absolutely. their investment I- IP going out. And so in terms of then, like we're, you know, the the trigger for a lot of this is what's so expensive going to an advisor? And, you know, that's sort of a separate debate, um, I think, depending yeah. on who you talk to. However, I, I agree um, there's certainly an entree into, you know, for some people they've just got a lump of money, I just want to invest it. Like it's it's yeah. as simple as that, you know. They, I just want to put this money in the money, you know. So having a solution that meets that makes sense. Clearly, this isn't advice fee sort of connected because it's not personal advice. Yeah, I'm presuming there is some sort of ch- like so. You know, what is what does the client pay the ad- advice firm or accounting firm if at all? Like, how does that work? Yeah, great question. And often when I have a conversation with an advice firm i've I've got to get them to actually step out of their advisor mindset for a moment um which can be quite difficult so <laughs> because in our in the open invest structure uh, legal structure when uh, an advice firm offers its model portfolios um through our structure they're actually acting as a portfolio manager in our uh, registered in our IDPS like registered managed investment scheme. So what that means is they're able to um, offer their investment IP. They're able to monetize it. What I mean by that is they can actually charge a model portfolio fee because it's actually got nothing to do with personal advice. So it's really helping firms understand what is general advice, how can you offer an, an online investment solution, how can you earn a recurring revenue which is sticky from the solution? It's a solution which you, you can then offer as part of your overall client value proposition, but it's not personal advice. So it's certainly a solution which can complement what you're doing on the personal advice uh, side of things, but yeah. you're not actually providing advice and therefore... Um, you're not charging an advisor fee. It's a portfolio management fee. But we we work very closely with all our firms. We make sure they're fully across the differences between, you know, general advice, personal advice. We provide a lot of support, conversation and guidance and tools and templates to help them understand the differences. And then we provide training across the whole of the firm. So, you know, for a lot of firms, it it is new. Mm. A lot of them haven't done general advice before so you know it's just working through the mechanism and understanding what they can do what they can say and, and often it's the journey how how's what's the journey of the investor getting to that solution i mean obviously you can provide advice and go through your normal and typical advice process yeah but then that's you wearing your advisor hat having to do an soa and charging appropriately uh, or this you know making someone aware that you've got an online investing solution, then it's general advice, that it's up to um, the prospect to go and choose uh, a portfolio um, and follow their nose from your website. And so okay. we help through all that mechanism. And do you, I mean, what, what are most of them doing? Are they doing something that's, um, uh, in terms of the model portfolios, they then sort of offer up? Um, for want of a better description, um, is it sort of risk based or is it more outcome based? Like, how are they presenting it in terms of then letting the client, you know, choose their own adventure in that sense? Yeah, and, and look, the model portfolios that the firms offer vary. So some mm-hmm. firms offer, you know, a fully diversified multi asset model portfolios across that sort of typical risk spectrum. So they may yep. have a conservative model, a balanced model, and a and a more growth oriented model. Some firms are offering sector specific models. And for example, I, I mentioned SWU Group there, specifically targeting the sort of Chinese community. Yep. So they've got an Asia specific model, which is, yeah, you know, okay. appeals to that yep. audience. So um so really, you know, it's it's up to the advice firm to understand their audience, understand their database, understand who they're trying to reach so for example you know if if an advice firm particularly wanted to reach the next generation um you know they may 
They may be looking more at a low-cost type model portfolio where they're only yep. using ETFs to manage funds. And it might be ESG flavor to it because, yep. as we know, you know, the next generation investors, um, you know, socially responsible uh, investing is very important to them. So it's about choosing the models and building models which appeal to the audience that you're trying to attract. And it, and it doesn't have to be the same model that you run under the advice business because a lot yep. of firms choose not to offer the same portfolios because they don't want to cannibalize what they're doing on the advice side. Yep. Um, so they choose different model portfolios for their online investing um, yeah, okay. solution. And so you, and you talk about the journey because you mentioned content too as yes. part of this. Um, so is is it more like is there just a, you know, a whole lot of stuff that the firm can then put up or is it something that's almost um, – follow the bouncy ball style of content? How does it generally work for the client? Yeah. Um, so what we've actually done is not only did we build uh, an investment platform, but we also actually built a publishing platform to marry up with the investment platform. So what that means is that an advice firm has now also got the ability uh, to publish um, content uh, mm-hmm. engaging content and that content can be video content it can be you know written content it could be podcasts images whatever it is but what it means is they they can actually push out content when they're ready and that could be around portfolios so if they've made a change to the portfolio or they simply just want to provide their thinking on the portfolio it could be you know articles financial education financial well-being it could be promoting other services in their business but Essentially, the platform was really built on the premise that content is king. So it delivers a very easy way to deliver unique and engaging content that creates this emotional connection with their brand, Mm -hmm. which is particularly important for, obviously, um, Gen Y and Jet Z who want that digital content experience. Yeah. Um, But what we do is we work very closely uh, with firms to encourage them to consistently use this functionality uh, and really help them, um, you know, write things in a very plain English um, manner. We provide them with a lot of examples. We're actually working at the moment with a bank of content which the firms can take Mm -hmm. and they just brand their own or they just push out. So it's really designed as this, not only an investment platform which takes the investor on this investment journey, but the ability for the firm to actually communicate on a one-to-many um, level through uh, the end investor app um, and investor portal and constantly sort of build confidence in the end investor uh, and bring this brand awareness to them uh, in, in the palm of their hand. Yeah, okay. And so let's imagine somebody's come to it and we're talk- maybe it's um- – Maybe it is the kids of, of a client or it's somebody that's come to them from hearing them on radio, like you say, something like that, and they've yeah. invested in um, the particular model portfolio. It's ticking along and then down the track, um, you know, they've got a query that's sort of more strategic in nature and they want some assistance. Can that be triggered through the tool to the advisor? How does that all work? Yeah, that's a great question. So part, part of what we're building at the moment actually is um, the ability – for because um, currently it's a general advice solution yeah so it's actually the end investor who's in control of the journey so the end mm. investor jumps on the website the, the firm's website the investor chooses the model portfolio from the information that the firm decides to present the investor opens the account via an online um, literally takes five minutes online application the investor then engages with that firm um, via an investor portal and app, and they can tran- the investor can transact and pull off reports and so forth. Yeah. But what we're building out um, shortly, uh, th- will be released in the coming months, is actually advisor functionality as well. So allowing the advisor not only to open an account and service and transact, but also the ability for uh, the end investor to, c- to see all the advisors in that firm in the investor portal to be able to click a button, connect with an advisor if they need strategic advice, call yep. the advisor. We've got the ability to then show the, the advisor's profile, a little bio and their email. So it becomes this real great way of a general advice client connecting with not only the brand of the firm, but also individual advisors 
within that firm Mm -hmm. and then take that next step. They may have had an inheritance or they feel and they need some strategic advice. Then through the software and tech, be able to actually contact contact, um, the advisor directly and have a conversation about becoming a full-blown personal advice client. Yeah, okay. And I can see um, that's that's probably where the content can come into play, you know, cleverly um, having content that might might um, bring to mind some of the needs that, yes. you know, a, an advice, you know, a personal advice, you know, solution can meet um, then and to make them aware that, hey, you know, if that meets the meets your need, then reach out. So I think that's that's where the content can be clever because otherwise um, the danger is that they see they see this as the only solution um, and if something does come up, they go elsewhere, you know. So I think the content probably is powerful um, for yeah. ensuring they're aware of the expertise of the firm and, and what they can provide to them other than what they're currently getting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the ability for the firm to publish, you know, um, articles and that could be a video as well mm. it is key because you know that's the firm's opportunity to start building that confidence in that end investor pushing you know letting that investor know that hey we've got all these other services available it might be you know hey you know have a thought about will writing or inheritance or hey send a financial year tax statement whatever it is it's mm. just give this great opportunity for the firm um, to make the investor aware of everything they offer. Yeah, so I think so. It makes a lot of sense to me from that you know that sort of um, path, I guess, where it's it's the starting point is general, and it might escalate over time to personal. I think that now it's not an experience that the public or even the advice sector has designed well before. So I yeah. think it's it's new in that sense. But I think that that makes perfect sense. I I can see the possibility of challenges when it's the reverse, when it's going from, you know, a historical personal advice relationship and, you know, that becomes more and more difficult due to cost, you know, all sorts of reasons. Um, Shifting it back um, is potentially difficult only because they're used to just call, you know, markets happen, they're used to just calling, you know. Yeah. (laughs) But I just talk to the advisor when I'm worried, you know. So I think that would require a fair bit of – I guess it's change management, some really intensive change management to get them used to the fact um, that, you know, if they freak out about markets, which I mean is is one of the things that is quite common in those, when they get to that point, often the interactions are purely about that, you know, um, yeah. Yeah. and it's, it, it is that sort of handholding that that's the difference, you know, that's what you won't be getting as part of this. Yeah. I mean, probably worth me adding actually, we, we within the end investor portal and the app and you know throughout the sign up process there you know we we offer our own customer support experience yep. so we do all that for the firm so anyone who's got a question they can phone up um, there's a chat box which they can write a question in and so we handle all the queries and actually um i haven't got the data at hand but mo- most of the queries coming in i generally actually don't relate to um you know our the investment decisions or what's going on in markets. Because remember, the content publishing aspect of it means that the advisor firm can actually be on the front foot. Yeah. And, and you know, if markets are going haywire, they can publish something straight away that yes. morning. If markets have been going crazy, particularly in the US overnight, they can publish something straight away and provide that confidence to that investor. Yeah. Um, and within the system, there's, you know, so many... Uh, automatic notifications built in where you know if they publish um, let's say a portfolio update and they're talking about markets and you know what's going on yeah. an automatic email lands in that investor's inbox and you know encourages them to log on and and, and take a read so that yeah that sort of means that you know the queries that we're handling we don't often see many around the investment side. But if we do get those queries to say, hey, I just want to talk to someone about the investment, not sure what's going on, then we would normally pass that on to the firm. But yep. key, actually, I'm glad you mentioned it because key to all this is really when a firm is setting up their own online investor solution, key to this is really them embedding it uh, into their current operating system yes, um, as opposed to just having it as a sort of satellite satellite service yep. um, so it's really them embracing this and bringing them into, bringing it into their complete offering um, and often that 
maybe depending on uh, how successful they become it may, it may mean that they have a dedicated person who you know is that sort of go-to within the business who does take those calls if they come in yeah and is able to deal with um those general advice clients as well yeah um but again we we sort of talk that through with the firms and make sure they understand and are fully armed with the resources that they need yeah and i think um you know there's probably a transition process then um for the firm themselves if they if they've sort of so for example if they're not currently responding like you say to market issues with content so if that's not something that's part of their model already, and, and I mean it could be a webinar or it could be an email or whatever they yeah. normally do, you know, when, when things go good or bad or, or sideways, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then if they're not doing that already, then that's probably um, going to be a challenge because it, from what you're describing, that's the way to almost preempt you know, the queries, that's the way to provide the complete solution is such that the material that hits them is right at the thought, you know, the moment where they go, oh, I just saw the news and I saw this, I wonder what that means. And then it goes, badink, hey, <laughs> we just put together this video on what's going on with, you know. So so I guess that is also something that um, the firm probably needs to consider, like you say, is, well, what are you doing already along these lines? And then how can you apply that? to this part um, of your offering. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. In terms of integration, I'm betting, I'm guessing because it's not part of um, a normal advice process, then you guys probably don't need to integrate with, you know, the normal advice tools. Have you got any integrations in place? Uh, yeah, look, uh, currently we don't integrate with any other tools, but we, we are an open API-enabled technology solution. So this okay. is certainly something we're keen on. Um, and we can work with any external party yep. on either pushing or pulling data via API integration. Yep. Um, so, yeah, currently in, in terms of advice um, software, I guess, um, but don't, we've, we've got discussions going on with, for example, the likes of Fin365 yep. um, and looking at how we integrate with them. We're actually currently work, working on a project to integrate with BGL, yep. the accounting software. So. You know, we've got projects going on which are looking at ways of integrating and supporting advice firms where they've got uh, their personal advice software in play. Um, but we're also actually t looking at other ways of how we could help the experience for the end investor, but also the, uh, the advice firms. And yep. for example, like currently we're, we're in discussion with a third party who provide tools um, that help both the pre and the post investor journey. Yes. So we're looking at how do we integrate those into the tech, make that journey better for the end investor. That's great for the firm as well. So yeah, there, there's a lot of stuff that we're looking into and that, that we can do and that we're working on. And I mean, as a foundation to be, you know, operating open API is a start, right? Because it means then it's not a big leap um, to. Uh, integrate with another tool that's similar. So whether it's, you know, the more broader CRMs, you know, things like that, where it might just be, like you say, about some basic data or or even triggers. I mean, that's something that, that um, we find valuable with tools that can talk to each other is just a, hey, they did this, so it triggers something else in the system, in another system, yeah. you know, it's that stuff. Um, often we overcomplicate those things, whereas sometimes those triggers are enough. Um, uh, it just helps you get even just a picture of the individual. Yeah. Um, based on their behavior, you know, that can be really powerful. So the fact that it's on that um, already on a sort of an open API approach is, is exciting. And it's one of those things that um, I'm hoping more and more of the tech that comes into play in advice tech and fintech does that because that's how we can all get these great end results, you know, these wonderful tech stacks that really work for us. Well, that's right. And, and there's no reason why, you know, particularly the new tech pieces of technology well, they can't just share data. I mean, it is, yeah. it, it's like you said, we don't need to overcomplicate things. It's really just sharing data. Yeah. And, you know, firms, why can't firms use different tools and different pieces of software? But, you know, why can't we allow in all those pieces of software just to talk to each other? Yeah. It is sort of actually to just um, <laughs> Andrew, who's our CEO and co founder, we always have a bit of a laugh because we, you know, we always, take things forward to our IT team for development and we always, you know, have this hashtag, how hard can it be? 
because <laughs> we're not IT guys. We're like, yeah, how do you know? Surely that's just a spreadsheet. Uh, so. <laughs> well, look, with the world of um, chat GPT and other AI solutions that can write you the code when you ask it for a particular thing, um, I think all of that world's going to change significantly. Yes. Um, you yes. know, the barriers to, to tech development, um, I think, are going to come down super fast. Uh, so, you know, I we'll agree. see what happens. I agree. Actually, yeah, I mean, this AI, particularly chat GPT, I know there's other AI mm. systems out there. I mean, I actually, I, I use quite a cool one. Um, which does through a um, graphic design, but for Chat GPT, yeah, I mean, look, we've been looking at AI as well, mm. and particularly in how how do we use AI to support firms with content and marketing? Yep. And there's some since we've been looking into this, there's some great, you know, great businesses out there, forward thinking Australian businesses, for example, we're, we're in discussion with one at the moment who, you know, use AI in, in marketing and and. Um, really sort of work with firms to um, not only look at their marketing plan, they use AI to sort of implement everything. And so, yeah, there's some interesting stuff going on in this space. Correct. And and when you think about, um, you know, what would be powerful, I mean, we were just talking about an example of, you know, an, a firm or an advisor being able to produce content that's going to almost answer the question before the individual or the client knows they're going to ask it, you know, so that really sort of responsive based on external factors, yeah. um, you know, that sort of thing would be a wonderful tool to have, okay, they, this is the noise out in, say, you know, Australians, these are the questions they're asking generally, whether it's yeah. in chat groups or whatever it might, might be. Here's the, the, you know, the top 10 things that are being asked for this week and that just – poses that to the firm or the advisors and go, hey, if you want to be topical, pick one of those. <laughs> like, yeah. off you go. You know? <laughs> that's right. I mean, even that, even that's powerful because a lot of what we end up writing, I know I'm guilty of this, is so defined by, by our own window into these things and our own bubble. And it's not necessarily what would add the, be, you know, be most beneficial or yeah. is actually from the consumer's bubble, you know. So yeah. sometimes those insights where really all they're asking, I mean, like it might be what the hell is inflation? Like yeah. <laughs> we're all talking as if everybody knows what that is. What if that's something that everybody keeps on asking? Oh, I don't even know what the, what the hell inflation is, you know, like <laughs> like getting that insight um, so that you can target your content and really make it land for people. Um, I mean, all of that effort wasted you know, or the time saved because you know it's going to it's gonna really hit well is fantastic. I'm really oh, excited absolutely. by those sort of things. Absolutely. I mean, I, I don't know if any anyone listening in has sort of been onto chat GPT, but uh, Stacey, who's our chief marketing officer, she's, she's just posed a few questions to chat GPT. You know, it's simple questions like you said, you know, what is inflation or mm. you know, what is diversification? Yep. And the the output has actually been surprisingly really good, written in a very clear, concise, easy to understand. And like you said, it's it's not us as industry participants writing it with our experience and knowledge and often we write in a very industry professional specific way. It's actually yep. written in a very, you know, easy to understand way for the mass market. And so when it comes to producing content, I mean, literally, you know, in Less than a minute, you can pose a question, have something printed off, read it through, check it. Yeah, that sounds great. Publish it. Um, and because it's you know, none of the work on um, chat GPT is copyrighted, I don't think, so you can use it. You know, it's, it means that firms have actually got now got access to heaps of content and questions and answers that they can start pushing out. And point. particularly, particularly as I think, um, for many, you know, in our industry, then one of the biggest barriers is just starting with that yes. stuff. Like very few of us have got to the point. I'm trying really hard to get to this point, but very few have got to the point where we can produce content consistently, like it's a machine, like we yeah. are with other things in the business. And so to have something that just breaks that first, <laughs> that, you know, jumps over that first hurdle is, well, here's, Here's a sample of what you could write. I mean, the thing you end up writing might in no way look like that, but it's a yeah. really good start to just trip that behavior. I mean, I even managed to ask it some questions and then, you know, it's me here. So, you know, I, my writing always leans on the cheeky side. And so I, I said to it, oh, can you please rewrite that with a cheekier tone? And it did. 
Now, it didn't exactly sound like me, but it was much closer to that. So, you know, you can really get a long way and then just, you know, do your thing to it, you know, yeah. and break it up and insert some of your own insights and all that sort of thing. But I agree. I think these tools are more about amplification. I don't think they replace the effort, um, but I think they can escalate it and amplify it for us, which is pretty exciting. I know this this whole AI thing is, you know, suddenly becoming a bit scary in a way, but... <laughs> I've I've actually just finished reading um, 2001 Space Odyssey. I <laughs> saw the film 30 years ago, but I saw I picked up the um, book from the from Hard Rubbish, someone had thrown away um, in Australia. And I just finished reading it, and you know that's I guess that really is talking about this sort of AI, um, you know, computers sort of taking over. And, uh, it's just, yeah, it's it's exciting exciting stuff. And look, I think. Um... We were literally um, talking about that with some friends last uh, yesterday over lunch, and the, the every every invention every made ever made has been used for good and bad, you know. And I think we sort of need to expect that with anything, yeah. right? And and I mean, crypto is another example of that, right? So um, I think it's more about understanding the shifts in um, in the world like this, if for no other reason than we need to understand them as people that understand investments. Like I think we have to understand these tools merely because we're going to need to help our clients understand them and how they might change the investing world and companies and their future. You know, so I think even if we don't plan on using them, um, which most of us probably are without realizing it, but even if we plan on avoiding them, I still think there's a level to which advisors need to get their head around it just because it will change industry. You yes. know, and so that therefore changes our advice. So we well, chatted about a few few things that are coming up. Is there anything else that's on the the future wish list or the future development plan that you guys are excited about? Uh, yeah, there's loads. Um, <laughs> so look, our I guess our ultimate goal is really to create, you know, can't live without platform experiences, both for the end investor and partner firms. And I've been, mm-hmm. I touched on there the sort of full advisor functionality um we'll, we're also working on um the ability for firms not only to be able to off their or offer their own model portfolios but also where they can offer a curated list of assets we've got uh international uh, so we're currently we can access the uh, uh, a London Stock Exchange, and we've got assets available on Luxembourg, but we're going mm-hmm. live on the 1st of June with um, New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ. Yep. And then we, the next sort of big project in line for us is really fractionalization, which is really all designed to lower the entry point right. to help more people. So, you know, how can someone with, um, you know, $500 yeah invest in a fully diversified model portfolio and gain access to professional management typically you know that um, that can't happen when you're yep. talking lower lower events and so we're, we're going to be building out and looking at fractionalization where you know the entry point into a model portfolio or an asset can start for as little as ten dollars or whatever it might be so that that really then opens up being able to help more Australians because mm. it's, it's not just for the wealthy, right? Investing should be for everyone. Yeah. Um, but professional investing and getting access to professional help should be for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that that is very exciting, actually, because I think it's where the disconnect with the public happens is when, well, you've got to have this amount. And they're like, well, isn't part of me getting that amount by getting help and investing well, like it's this circular argument, you know. So um, having a solution that lets them start to put money aside um, and experience the investing world early, uh, I think is really powerful. Yeah. Uh, so that's, oh, that's super exciting. Have we, is there anything else we've missed? Have we sort of covered the broad areas of what you guys offer? Yeah, I, th- I think so. I, th- I think uh, probably the other thing I just want to add is, you know, we for us working with advice firms, it's really a long term collaborative approach and, and we apply that collaboration across everything we do. So for us it's not just about getting a partner firm live and waving them goodbye, wishing them well <laughs> and hopefully they go on their way and start signing up investors. We actually, you know, work work very closely with each partner firm. We share ideas. So hey look, 
hey, this what this partner firm A has done, they've done this EDM, we share the wording, or hey, here's partner firm B, they've held an event for their existing clients and family and friends and kids, here's what they've done. So it's really about creating this environment where we all share from each other and we all learn. Um, you know, we're not in competition with each other. Yeah. Uh, we're just trying to help as many people as we can. And all our partner firms are in in with that mindset. And, you know, we're working with some of the most, you know, ambitious and progressive uh, firms some of who I've mentioned today. And, yeah, I think that sort of collaboration is key. And so, you know, for any firms out there who sort of are interested, just say reach out. But yeah. it's definitely not something that you feel you need to just uh, do by yourself. We provide a lot of support and a lot of discussion and uh, and so forth. Fantastic. All right, Advice Explorers. If you'd like to find out more about Open Invest, then the website link is in the episode show notes, along with Ravi's LinkedIn details. I'm sure he'll then point you in the right direction of who can help and and who can start your journey. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Ravi, and for sort of uh, – adding to the tool bag we have as advisors to sort of help all of the various sectors of the public. I think the more we have of these, then the more likely we are going to get to the great portion of the Australian public that we all struggle to serve. So thank you very much for joining us and for adding some great value. Thanks for having me, Peter. It's been a pleasure. So, are you one of the firms currently using Open Invest? It's not a huge list, but you might be one of those. So, we'd love to hear. I'm sure all of the listeners um, of today's episode would love to hear how you found it, how, why it works for you, how you know the public respond, how the clients respond. Please share your insights on the Ensemble Community platform, as this is how we all get a bit of feel um, for what solutions might work as we go forward, and and you know really do sort of build out the different offerings we have for different sectors of the community. In terms of my thoughts for this sort of tool, um, I think you know, in in talking through with Revy of what what you can provide and and what needs to be clear before you can, I think that you know having a well thought out. Um, structured, documented investment methodology will be fundamental to doing this. Um, if that hasn't been enunciated sort of in writing, regular revisits, you've got meetings set, you know, like you've really got a, a humming sort of schedule for that. Um, if you haven't done that first, then I think it would probably be a struggle to implement something like this tool uh, because essentially, like Ravi said, you're shifting into that sort of portfolio manage- management role. So um, it's this is less one-to-one. It's more about the overarching solution, the logic of why you've selected it um, and how it works. So I think, you know, that is sort of a first step. The second step, I think, after that would be having something that pulls that together in a way that somebody could then pick which of them they choose. So how do you sort of, um, you know, disseminate that in a way that makes um, it clear and and really easy to understand for somebody who's just landing on a website, which is essentially what's going to happen here and making a choice. So I think that's probably the first key thing, yeah, is, is the investment methodology. The second, I think, will be about getting a structure and a schedule around your responsive content. So there's certainly content that can be the underlying, you know, the theories behind these things. So you could almost cut up your investment methodology and make that part of um, the content that goes out. But I think you would also need to think about, you know, how often are you going to produce things? Uh, Is it going to be a topical five-minute thing every week, month, whatever, like whatever it might be that talks about what's going on um, and therefore what might be occurring with their investment and, you know, being ready to do that, to machine it, to have it happen consistently um, because that is the offer right? So that's what you're providing. So I think those are the two key elements that would be fundamental to implementing a tool like this really well. Um, I don't think any of us would doubt that it could fit very well within a certain um, group that you might be trying to attract and being able to focus on a category and then have 
you know, one type of general advice solution or um, a tailored personal advice solution. I think that, you know, down the track, that's going to make sense for more and more practices uh, so that we can really, our niche becomes more about the community we serve as opposed to somebody who can pay, right? <laughs> it's it That becomes less material um, as the community itself, the particular niche that we select. Now, as you know, there's only one skill we need to become bionic advisors, and that is avid curiosity. And to help you build that habit, you know, we've got our curiosity corner section of the episode each week. Today's app that caught my eye is Storytale. Now, you can find it at storytale.io. These guys are actually in beta, um, but their tagline is Break the Screen create and host live content that tells your story for the reaction it deserves. Um, This came about because the founders saw the sort of virtual events and meetings we were all taking part in and running during lockdowns um, and realized we needed a better way to engage people virtually that just wasn't sharing our screen, which is what we all do, what I literally just did last week for a webinar that I ran. So, you know, they've, you know, that's the sort of thing they're going, hey, how can we elevate that and how can we lift our game? You know, and so the tool goes well beyond a screen share of slides and it actually gets your audience involved in your content rather than just watching it. Um, you can embed type forms, newsletter opt-ins, um, polling, all actually clicked on by the attendees through the screen they're watching you on, um, not via, say, a link in the chat or something that's separate. So it's all embedded in this experience. So it's a journey that happens on the screen that can be branded to the way you want it to be branded. And to be honest, really looks really cool. It, it almost sort of looks more like you're going through an app experience than just a screen share experience. In fact, I'm so excited about the possibility of this concept. Um, I'm actually going to be running some tech tip sessions over the next little while, trialing this technology specifically. Um, So if you're curious about it and want to find more, then be sure to follow me on LinkedIn and then I'll share when the next session is going live and you can register for it and and experience it for yourself. Um, It may be something you could use for your clients, for your targets, even for internal training. If you've gone virtual, maybe you've got your team you want to connect with. There's so many ways that you could utilize this tool um, for pitches, all sorts of things. So uh, Definitely, you know, follow me on LinkedIn, connect if you're interested, um, and we can see what we think and help be part of developing the tool into its next phase. Welp, that's all we've got for this week. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice tech fix order magically sent to you each Friday. And I'd really love to hear what session or webinar or presentation you would love me to run in the future. You know what? Hot, you know, how to session <laughs> would add the most value. You know, is there a particular section of advice tech you'd love an introductory webinar on? You know, maybe what would you like to learn more about? You know, how can I even add value in your, the business transformation space to you? Um, and of course, if you're keen to have me as a speaker at Say Your Dealer Group's next event, then please don't hesitate to let me know, DM me on uh, LinkedIn, and I'm super happy to reach out to them and let them know how I can help. Um, of course, you can find me on LinkedIn forward slash Peter MD. That's P-E-I-T-A-M-D. Otherwise, I'll look forward to turning up in your earbuds next week. And remember, Advice Explorers, stay curious. 